Hello, dear viewers. How are you today? It's Andrew Lapamardo again, and today's lesson is 11 unmade Halloween movies. What John Carpenter started in 1978 with his classic slasher film Halloween turned out to be a guide to other franchises like Scream and Elm Street. Yes, we did have other great films like Alfred Hitchcock's 1960 masterpiece Psycho to influence Mr. Carpenter's work. But Halloween's Michael Myers has had his own unique appeal. In times to come, the Halloween franchise would see several sequels and a spin-off. The latest revival that started in 2018 with Halloween follows the original in terms of continuity and ignores everything else. The first film was probably the most successful film, both commercially and critically, for the sole reason that it was simple in its story. Michael was a deranged man who wanted to hurt Laurie Strode, no matter the cost or who came in his way. The future films tried to elaborate on the lore, his reasoning, and rationale behind the killings, but the story only got exceedingly convoluted. Now, with more than 12 films in the franchise, and another one slated for release in 2022, it shouldn't come as a surprise that many more projects may have started and left abandoned at various stages. Writers and directors were often asked to create new and exciting stories about Michael Myers, but not all of them could take off from the ground. Would you believe that Quentin Tarantino also had a Halloween idea at one point in time? So, in this video, we will take you through 11 unproduced Halloween films that burned away in developmental hell. And let us remind you, some of these have more caliber than the films we eventually saw. Let's begin, shall we? Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Number one, Michael Myers vs. Pinhead. In the early 2000s, Dimension Films had this not-so-unique idea of pitting Michael Myers from the Halloween franchise against Pinhead from the Hellraiser franchise in a death match, in a merger that many have called Halloween. By that time, we had already seen Freddy vs. Jason, and the film had turned out to be a massive success commercially if not critically. But the studio never managed to come up with a workable story, and the project died a premature death. But the primary issue with such a crossover would be the stark difference that these two bad boys share in their terms of powers. Yes, Michael Myers is one of the most badass slasher villains that Hollywood has produced, and he is practically a sink for incoming damage, but he's nowhere close to Pinhead, who's a minion of death and comparable to a demon. Working for the god of hell, i.e. Leviathan, he has several powers, including telekinesis and, well, the entire force of hell for him to exploit. Furthermore, Pinhead is already dead. According to the Hellraiser films, it is an established fact that Pinhead used to be a human named Elliot Spencer, who solved the puzzle called the Lament Configuration, which was nothing but a doorway to hell itself. Pinhead can only be killed by destroying the Lament Configuration, but figuring that out is kind of difficult for the bumbling fool that Michael is. And according to the Halloween franchise, Michael is simply just a super resilient serial killer. Yes. Some of you may say that he's supernatural too because of the curse of the druid cult, etc. But then, the Halloween franchise is an absolute mess in terms of continuity. So, the only way for Michael and Pinhead to have a fair and just fight would have been to place them on the same pedestal, by either making Michael immortal, courtesy of his Curse of Thorn, or by making Pinhead somehow killable. Although these two fighting together seems like a fight between a Predator and Superman, the film would have been fun to watch. Number 2, Halloween Returns. In 2015, Patrick Melton and Marcus Dunstan wrote a script for Michael Myers to return to the big screen in a film titled Halloween Returns. The film would have served as a soft reboot and would have followed Michael's story after the first two films. According to the script, Michael Myers was awaiting his death sentence in the year 1988. But just before his execution, he escapes imprisonment because of a power outage. The rest of the story takes place in the small town of Russellville, the neighboring town of Haddonfield. Michael continued with his carnage in Russellville and painted it red. As for his objective behind the carnage, 
this time around, he would be after the young daughter of Officer Gary Hunt from Halloween 2. However, the project could never be realized because Dimension lost the rights to Michael Myers, and Bloomhouse decided to ditch the project in favor of retconning the franchise. As you already know, the franchise will see a final end with Halloween Ends in 2022. Number 3, Rob Zombie's Halloween 3D, Zombie Michael. At the end of Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, Laurie kills Michael by stabbing him multiple times. Now the script for Halloween 3D takes off from Laurie's perspective, and we learn that the person she killed was in fact Loomis. Lee Brackett appears on the scene and remains in denial about Laurie killing Loomis. The script then introduces a new protagonist called Amy and a bunch of her drunken friends. Well, we do need some stupid drunk teens for Michael to kill early in the film. Meanwhile, Brackett takes Laurie in his cruiser, but they get ambushed by Michael, who takes Laurie with him, while Brackett gets badly injured. Brackett then meets Dr. Josie Blair, who happened to have prior experience with Michael, and together they try to figure out where Michael may have taken Laurie. It turns out that Michael and Laurie are now working together and are exhuming the grave of Deborah Myers when Amy and her friends find the two. Carnage ensues as Michael slays Amy's friends. Just before Michael is about to kill Amy, Laurie hears police sirens and stops Michael. They throw Amy into the grave and almost bury her. But this was just a ploy to throw the cops off their trail. Although the cops free Amy, they lose Laurie and Michael, who are found by Brackett and Josie. But Michael attacks the two of them and heavily injures Josie. He then gives Laurie a knife to finish Josie off once and for all. But as fate would have it, the ambulance, which was carrying Amy from the graveyard, accidentally strikes Laurie. And another high octane action sequence ensues between Michael, Brackett, Laurie, Officer Cooper, and Amy. In the end, Meyer seemingly dies because of an explosion, while Laurie shoots Brackett down. The script then opens a year later, in J. Burton Institute, where Amy is under the care of Josie. Furthermore, Laurie is also present in the same institute. The rest of the script deals with Michael's attempts to rescue his sister Laurie from the institute at all cost. While Officer Cooper makes an elaborate plan to blow up Michael with C4, when he comes to his sister's rescue, Rob Zombie had already clarified that he wouldn't return for a third Halloween film, but that it was not an issue because Weinstein Company had greenlit the project, and they even signed Patrick Lucier to take the director's chair. However, the film ended up rotting away in developmental hell. <laughs> Number 4, Zapia's Halloween 7. There have been a string of scripts that almost got turned into Halloween film. One of them being Zapia's Halloween 7. This was pitched as a direct sequel to Halloween 6. According to the script, Michael would have found himself in prison and then a morgue, where he would have come to life under strange and mysterious circumstances. <laughs> Following his revival, he would go to a girl's prep school and prey on little students, one of whom was to be Michael's distant relative. While Michael would have taught the little girls the miraculous things that his big bad knife could do, the cops would initially fail at catching him. They would then take help from one of Michael's copycat killers to nab Michael. This was very similar to the plot of Silence of the Lambs, but then it probably would have been a terrible ripoff of the classic. Interestingly, the script also had a role for Jamie Lee Curtis as Laurie, but the script ended up having a million edits and ultimately never lived to see the light of day. Zapia's original script was titled Two Faces of Evil. Number 5, Quentin Tarantino's Halloween 6 idea. There have been many great people who have lent their minds and time to the Halloween franchise. It's another story altogether that most of these great ideas never bore any fruit. However, one such man was Quentin Tarantino, who was approached by the executives to pen down a Halloween 6 script. At the end of Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers, Loomis shoots Michael with several tranquilizer darts. 
Later, the police arrive and take an unconscious Michael into custody. He was to be later transferred to a maximum security prison, but a mysterious man in black broke him out of the local police's custody. Now, Tarantino's idea about Halloween 6 largely revolved around the relationship between the man in black and Michael Myers. After the man in black would have broken Michael out of prison, the two of them would have taken a road trip. And along the way, they would have made several pit stops where Michael would kill a person and then the two would proceed with the trip. However, this sounds pretty strange because given the personality that Michael has, he wouldn't necessarily be someone who would want to sit in a car wearing his seatbelt to wait for the next kill session. He would rather kill the man in black and go on with his killing spree independently. And yet we cannot deny that Tarantino has the talent of turning even the most ridiculous and unbelievable ideas into successful and conceivable stories. However, this idea only remained an idea and now has become an entry in this video. In Halloween 6, it was revealed that the man in black was none other than Terrence Wynn, a colleague of Loomis and the head of a druid-like cult. Number 6, Phil Rosenberg's Halloween 666, The Origin. Phil Rosenberg's script was to serve as a sequel to Halloween 5, but unfortunately, it didn't really have anything new to bring to the table. Halloween 5 ended in a bloody shootout in Haddonfield, following which the authorities banned Halloween celebrations in the town for the next five years. When things seemed to be normal again, they opened the town for Halloween celebration, but the decision divided the people of Haddonfield. Half of them were still apprehensive about the holiday, and, well, they should be, given the events that they had experienced. Now, whenever there's an event of public dissent, media houses have a field day. Naturally, a Chicago-based television crew reaches Haddonfield to cover the issues on the ground. Among the team is a reporter from Channel 6 News named Dana. As the crew starts to investigate and interview people around, Dana starts having nightmares of Michael, who hasn't been seen in the past five years. It later turns out that Dana was Michael's long-lost sister, and that is why she was seeing him in her nightmares. As far as Michael is concerned, he was depicted as living as a hobo in a shelter home along with other homeless people, who who have accepted Michael as one of their own because they do not know who he really is. Tommy is portrayed as a recluse, just like we saw in the Halloween 6 film, but he's way more involved with Michael than in the movie. While Loomis had an important role in the film that we eventually saw, in Rosenberg's script, he was sent to the Smith's Grove Sanitarium. So it is evident that many of the best elements of the script were retained in Halloween 6, Curse of Michael Myers. But Rosenberg's script as a whole didn't have much metal in it and was eventually discarded. Number 7, Dominique Other Than Gerard's original Halloween 5 script. At the end of Halloween 4, the state troopers and an armed posse arrive to save the protagonist and shoot the boogeyman left, right, and center, sending him down a mine shaft. Now, Dominique Other Than's script wanted to take Michael's story and character to a different course altogether. According to the script, a lightning bolt strikes Michael, not only resurrecting him, but also washing away all the evil that plagued Michael's soul. Although he remained the hulking monster that he was, he became a harmless, gentle giant. The bulk of the story revolved around Michael defending himself against the people of Haddonfield, who couldn't come to terms with the fact that Michael was a changed being. <laughs> They would continue to go after him, and he would kill only in self-defense. Furthermore, Loomis would have come to his rescue because he was the only one who truly knew that Michael had changed from within. However, this was a radical shift from the story that had been built in the past four movies. If we count the third installment that didn't feature Michael, this sort of redemption being accorded to the psycho killer was similar to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and could have taken Michael in various directions. A good Michael Myers is equivalent to a lion who eats grass. Well, it doesn't quite fit. And naturally, executive producer Mustafa Akkad wasn't keen on going forward with this take on Michael's changed and elevated personality. Ah! <laughs> 
Number eight, Dennis Etcherson's Halloween 4. While Dennis Etcherson is known for his novelizations of Halloween 2 and Halloween 3, he was also once contacted by John Carpenter and the late Deborah Hill to write the script for Halloween 4. Halloween 3 was a total disaster when it was released, primarily because there was no Michael Myers in it and the people hated the film. Naturally, they needed someone to fix that issue. Given that Eckerson had done appreciable work on the novelization of the second and third films, he seemed like the right choice. He wrote the script as a sequel to the first two films and completely ignored the events of the third, and thankfully so. So, his script opened 10 years after the events of the original film, and focused on Tommy Doyle and Lindsay Wallace, the two kids who were being babysat by Laurie Strode on the fateful night when Michael came to Haddonfield. Since then, the town of Haddonfield had banned Halloween because of the events that had unfolded. But 10 years later, repression was forcing the town to reopen itself to all things Halloween. And naturally, half the town was apprehensive about it. Interestingly, Etcherson had written his Michael Myers as a ghost of sorts, an idea that Carpenter and Hill appreciated, but Accard hated. Eventually, Carpenter and Hill sold their shares of the franchise to Accard for a hefty amount, and Etcherson got a call from Hill, informing him that his script was not part of the deal. Nevertheless, many of the events from his piece of work found their way into other Halloween films. For instance, Haddonfield did ban Halloween festivals in the sixth installment. Number 9, Halloween 2 High Rise Horror. The original film was a classic, but it didn't achieve that status in a day. During the initial days of its release, everyone, including Carpenter, thought that the film had bombed. However, slowly and steadily, it started gaining popularity, and the word spread like wildfire. Carpenter's film had become a massive hit by the time it was re-released in 1979. With this success, Universal decided to make a sequel. Although John Carpenter was not a man very keen on making sequels, but when he heard that the studio was going to make a sequel with or without him, he collaborated with Deborah Hill to pen down a sequel. Now, Halloween 2 picks up exactly where its predecessor had left off, and continues the story of Laurie Strode at the Haddonfield Memorial Hospital, where she was taken for treatment. However, the original script that Carpenter had written was quite different from what we eventually saw in Halloween 2. The original script would have picked up a few years after the events of the first film with Laurie living an extremely cautious life in an apartment in a high-rise building. After a period of time, Michael finds Laurie and attempts to kill her. Interestingly, even this script would have had the character of Dr. Loomis, but then they didn't go forward with the original idea and brought the focus back to Haddonfield. Suppose you've been a true Carpenter fan in that case? You'd probably be accustomed to his highly underrated television horror film, Someone's Watching Me, which followed the story of a young woman being stalked by a psychopath. Now, we know that Carpenter really isn't a sequel person. He just wanted to get done with the script and thought it would be best to tackle something that he had done earlier. However, it is also possible that he did not want to take a chance with the sequel and wished to go the tried and tested path because Someone's Watching Me is a really awesome film. And anyone who loves a good thriller or horror should go and check it out at their first leisure. Number 10, Halloween, The Missing Years. Did you ever wonder what Michael Myers was doing during the time you watched Halloween 3? Was he wreaking havoc someplace else? Or was he just waiting to be called again by the director of the next installment? Well, when screenwriter Jake Wade Wall was asked to write the script for the ninth installment of the film, he decided to take a unique stand and pen down a prequel of sorts that answered the earlier stated question and linked the third and fourth installments. In an interview with Bloody Disgusting, Wall revealed his plans for Halloween, The Missing Years, in which he wished to answer several questions pertaining to Michael's need for the mask, his childhood years, etc. His script would have gone back and forth, sometimes into the past events from his childhood at the sanitarium, and then Wall wanted to relate these events to Michael's future action. And since The Missing Years was chronologically set between the second and fourth films, it would have brought back several characters from the films. Furthermore, it would have had several interesting characters, such as a nurse at the Smiths Grove Sanitarium, who didn't see a monster in Michael Myers, and treated him with care and affection, and 
for whom Michael would have had similar feelings. This would have shown the relatively humane side of Michael, and also that he was capable of receiving and understanding care and love. But this project never saw the light of day, and the executives went ahead with hiring Rob Zombie to reboot the franchise. However, now that Halloween is picking up pace once again, and the franchise is supposed to see its end with the 2022 film, Halloween Ends, it is quite possible that they may consider making a prequel on the lines of Wall's work. <laughs> Number 11, Halloween Asylum. In 2004, Josh Goldfinger and Matt Verne had come up with a script that could have been turned into Halloween 9, instead of Rob Zombie's reboot. So the eighth installment, or Halloween Resurrection, ended with Michael reviving while the coroner was trying to examine him. Halloween Asylum would have focused on a nurse that Michael would stalk after this said revival. Oh yes, there was also something about killing inmates and staff of Smith's Grove Sanitarium. Well, same old, same old. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.